Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for giving to missions. As Lydia said, you can do it electronically and just designate missions, or you can uh, leave an offering at the Globe here during our final worship song, and all that goes uh, to our missionaries. The trips that Mark was talking about, if you're interested in getting more information about those, you can contact Mark at RedeemerPV.com. And for the Israel trip specifically, that's one we want to make sure you all get information on well in advance so you can plan uh, for that. That You can email Ronnie at ActForIsraelNow.com or you can stop out at the missions corner and get more information that way. You guys know we have an amazing kids ministry here. And what's been happening in our kids' ministry, it's just been blowing up. And uh, in every aspect, from youth to elementary kids all the way down to the nursery, just what's happening in our family ministries with kids is amazing. Last year, we had our biggest vacation Bible school ever. This year, we already have over 250 kids registered, and we only opened registration just recently. So... We know we're going to blow past what we did last year. We're probably going to exceed 400 kids at our Vacation Bible School. That is a boatload of kids, if you don't know. Some of our volunteers are considering quitting right now. Don't do that. We're coming up with some very creative ways to be able to accommodate that and make it an amazing experience, including we're going to get a tent, an air-conditioned tent out in the field to have an additional space out there. We've got some other ideas and things that we're going to do just to make it an amazing experience for families. And it's really a generational experience. We have not just the kids. We have, last year, I had over 100 teenagers volunteering to serve there. And they weren't there reluctantly or forced to. They were engaged and having a blast all the way up to adults and people from Joyfully 60 Plus volunteering uh, in our VBS. So it's going to be an amazing experience. Because the kids' ministry continues to explode, we've had to make some upgrades to how we deal with our security. I know you guys all appreciate that with things that we've seen happen in recent, in recent months. And uh, we want to continue to improve our security to our kids and to our families. And so what that means is we're shutting those hallways down during services. If you're a longtime member, you're used to just being able to you know, freely roam anywhere you want to go and go down those hallways, and now you can't, so that may be frustrating for you. But if you're in here and you need to go to the restroom, use these two doors right here. There's restrooms on both sides of these doors. Uh, used to, you would go out the back door and go down the hallway. We're trying to shut that down. You can go out these doors and use these restrooms. If you're out in the big epicenter or in the family center, there's restrooms over there as well. And so just help us to accommodate that. It may be frustrating, but I'm sure you can appreciate the improvements to the security for our kids. Can I get a big amen? Amen. 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 So be nice. If somebody says, I'm sorry, you can't go down this way. You've known me for 20 years. No, I'm sorry, but they've got to just do the uh, rule, okay? So go with it. Um, anyway, thank you for that. We're getting back into our series, Living Like Jesus. I mean, we are here to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel so that they can become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's what we are. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And if we are a follower of Jesus, we want to live like Jesus lived. And so we've been looking at that specifically in the gospel of Luke. And what we're looking at in the gospel of Luke are the spiritual practices of Jesus himself. What spiritual disciplines did he have if we are his followers, and how do we live by those? So we looked at the discipline of and the spiritual practice of simplicity for several weeks, and then we spent several weeks on humility. And now we're transitioning into another spiritual practice that you see present throughout Jesus' life, and that is the spiritual practice of prayer. And when we talk about, in our mission statement, reaching people to be followers of Jesus so that, everybody say, so that, so that they can become disciples, they can become fully devoted followers. What does a fully devoted follower of Jesus look like? It might, you know, have, you might have a different idea, we might have different opinions on what that looks like. And so in our growth track, we define what a fully devoted follower looks like here. We're saying, these are five core characteristics that we think are vital and are important. They're not the only ones, but we believe here these are five core characteristics that we want to see everybody, all of us, on some kind of growth track in these five areas, that we are fully devoted to God's Word. If we're going to know God, we need to know His Word. We can't get to know God apart from His Word. In the beginning was the Word, 
The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to mankind. This is helping us understand what it means to be in relationship with him. So we're fully devoted to God, fully devoted to God's Word. We're fully devoted to prayer. Prayer is our communication with God. There's lots of different things you can learn about prayer, but in its simplest uh, definition, prayer is communication with God. We're fully devoted to generosity. We've all benefited from God's generosity. The fact that we're sitting here today with air in our lungs is because of God's generosity. We're fully devoted to generosity. We're fully devoted to serving others. Each person carries his image, and we're fully devoted to the Great Commission, sharing this good news to everyone around us. So I'm talking today about being fully devoted to prayer. Now, there are a couple of misconceptions about prayer that I have seen you know, in church world and in, in people's lives. And one is this, the first misconception is this, that prayer doesn't really matter. Prayer doesn't change things. Everything's already preordained, so why even pray about it anyway? God already knows what's gonna happen, so what does it matter if I pray about it? So then people don't pray. In fact, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster addresses that mentality. And this is a great book on the spiritual disciplines. If you've never gone through it, I encourage you to. It's really a modern day classic. He says this, in our efforts to pray, it's easy for us to be defeated right at the outset because we have been taught that everything in the universe is already set. So the things cannot be changed. And if things cannot be changed, why pray? We may gloomily feel this way, but the Bible does not teach that. The Bible prayers, the people that prayed in the Bible, prayed as if their prayers could and would make an objective difference. The Apostle Paul gladly announces that we are co-laborers with God. That is, we are working with God to determine the outcome of events. It is stoicism that demands a closed universe, not the Bible. So Richard Foster identifies this mindset that we can wrongly think that prayer doesn't matter, that everything's already preset. God is sovereign, and God is the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the mega. He operates out outside of this time-space continuum that we live in, but we live in it. And God told us this is how we engage with it and that our prayer does matter. So one common mistake is to think that it doesn't, I don't need to pray because it doesn't matter. That's a mistake. Another mistake, though, is the opposite, the extreme opposite of that, and that is to think that we can control everything by our prayers. And so then what we try to do is we try to get the formula right, we try to get the technique right, we gotta have the right amount of faith, the right amount of words, the right amount of theology, we gotta get everything right, the circumstances, and then we can change, we can change everything. And if that doesn't work, we'll call a fast and we'll get everybody to gang up on God. And then God will do what we want him to do, right? That's also a wrong mindset. We don't, it's, that's not how it works. We don't, it's not about getting the formula right. So what is it about prayer? Why does it matter so much? This is what we're gonna be getting into this week and for the next couple of weeks. And Luke chapter five, verse 15 says this. This is after Jesus has done some miracles. And man, he's really starting to gain some momentum. Crowds are gathering, the meetings are huge. There's like, man, people are like, we really got some momentum. Verse 15, it says, but now even more the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to him to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And I love what Luke says here. This language that he uses is when he said, he would withdraw. It really uh, highlights the habitual nature, the habitual aspect of Jesus' prayer life. It doesn't say in Luke that he did withdraw. It says he would, like this was something that we've seen him do. He would withdraw, you know, there'd be all these great things happening. There'd be so many people would be there. Everybody would be wanting to hear from him and he would withdraw. This is something that he did as a regular part of his life. And Jesus himself said, a student is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. If it was necessary for Jesus to pray, how much more necessary is it for us? I mean, if there was one person that lived on this earth that could probably go through life without praying, I imagine it would be Jesus because he was the word made flesh. And yet still, he did. And, and he models this to us. And he also says, not only is a servant 
not above his master. A student is not above his teacher. Do this. This is the way that we should live our lives. Prayer is communication with God. Communication is the lifeblood of any relationship. If you have a relationship with somebody, communication is the lifeblood of that relationship. When communication gets, gets cut off, eventually that relationship drifts into feeling distant or far apart. And you can have the shell of a relationship but no life in it. Communication is the lifeblood of a relationship. Prayer is our communication with God. And communication is this. Communication is talking and listening. It's not just talking. Have you ever been around somebody that just talks all the time and never listens? One person has. <laughs> or else some of you are sitting beside the person you're afraid to say so. <laughs> but <laughs> no, don't start looking at each other. Don't do that. Well, we've all seen it, right? It's no fun to be around somebody that just talks all the time and doesn't listen. And then they actually miss something that they could benefit from if they took time to listen. Communication is talking and listening. I talk to God, but I also wait and I listen. Now, there's also a difference between listening and hearing. You can hear something and not listen, right? We can all hear things that go on and not really listen to actually the nuance of what's going on. An example, and I love movies, and an example from a movie that came to my mind when I was thinking about this is the movie The Fugitive. You guys ever seen that with Harrison Ford and with Tommy Lee Jones? Yeah, I love Tommy Lee Jones. He's got one character. He plays the same character in every movie. It doesn't matter, change his clothes, he's the same. He's always a little bit grumpy, a little bit annoyed, but he's really good at it. And uh, in this movie, he's a, he's a US Marshal and they're trying to catch Harrison Ford who's on the run. And they got everybody in the office and they, they have a recording of him making a phone call. And so they're trying to identify by the sounds in the background where he might be. And one of the officers goes, wait a minute, I recognize that sound. And he hears the sound and he, he identifies it as an elevated train in Chicago and they know exactly where he is by that one sound, right? That's the difference between listening and hearing. You can hear something and not listen. We're talking about listening with thoughtful attention. The picture is like, imagine uh, in the Olympics, these guys, they train and they get on the track and they're about to run. They've been working for this, preparing for this. They're on the track. They get in the blocks. You know, they're like shaking everything and they're smacking everything to get all the, you know, how they do that it looks impressive. And then they get down there like this and they're listening. Everything and every fiber in them is straining to hear one sound, the gun, because they got to get the jump. This is what it means to listen with thoughtful attention. Communication is talking and listening. Prayer is communication with God. That's what we're talking about. This is what we see as a normal part of Jesus' spiritual practice. He would withdraw to a private place, to a desolate place, and pray. And Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, One day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, again, this is you see this is a regular part of his life. One day this happened again, and Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. I mean, we know about prayers, and we have prayer books, but we, there's something different about the way you pray. Teach us. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into, into, into temptation. This is Luke's account of this story. And Matthew's account is a little bit different. Before I jump into that, I, I just want to say this first point. You see this with Jesus and my encouragement to you as a follower of Jesus and for me is that we would make prayer a priority. Make it a priority. Don't make it a last resort. Make it our first response. Don't wait till everything's on fire and then we go, hey, maybe we should pray. No, we, this is something that we want to be a part, a regular part of our lives. Make prayer a priority just as it was to Jesus. In Matthew's account of this, in verse 6, it says, they come to him and they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he says, well, don't pray like the hypocrites. He says, when you pray, go into your room. 
close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. In other words, he's saying like I was saying before, it's not about trying to get the formula right and get all the right words and get in there and think you're gonna impress God by having all these theological terms and saying all the right things and you know that's what's gonna do it. He says, don't, don't be like that. This is how you should pray. Don't, he says, don't be like them. Your father knows what you need even before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. This is how you should pray. We'll get into that in just a moment. My point here is, is the part where he says, when you pray. Not if you pray, when you pray. This needs to be something that is a priority in our lives. Make prayer a priority. Um, sometimes to make prayer a, re- a priority, it just requires a discipline. You have to treat it as a discipline. You have to schedule it. You have to set your alarm clock. You have to set time aside in the middle of the day or whenever is right for you. You have some discipline that you create in your life to pray because it's easy to stop and pray, but it's also easy not to stop and pray. It's easy to drive down the road, turn everything off, and actually pray while you're driving instead of other stuff. But it's also easy uh, to listen to the podcast or to make the phone call or whatever it is you're doing. We need to make it a discipline. Make prayer a discipline. When something is important, you prioritize it. And what begins as a discipline can oftentimes become a love. It can become a passion. Think about people that are really into certain sports. You know, they had to start with the discipline of practicing that sport, learning that sport, doing the the basic things that help get them ready to play that sport. Then it becomes a love. You know, Josiah, our youngest son, he loved soccer. But when he started playing soccer, it was like you have to go to practice. And when you go to practice, you have to do toe taps. And you have to do all these little things that are getting you. And eventually, the thing that you're doing as a discipline becomes something that you love and are passionate about. So many things are like this for us. It starts as a discipline, but it can become a love, a passion. And Daniel, the book of Daniel chapter six, Daniel heard that a decree had been written that made praying to God illegal. And it says, when Daniel learned that a decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to God just as he had done before. This was in his life, this was a discipline, this was something he did three times a day. Every day he did this. Even when a decree was published not to do it, he did it anyway. It was something that was, he was passionate about. Something that begins as a discipline. Make prayer a priority, even if it's a discipline, and watch how it will grow and how a love will grow for prayer. When, when uh, our kids were small, They're all grown now. But when our kids were small, we had a a 3F approach to a certain part of our parenting. And because we knew it was important for us to have time together, for the kids to have time together, for them to have time with us, to be in space together doing something. And so we called it forced family fun. (laughs) We're going to go do, I don't want to go do this. No, we're going and you're going to have fun. (laughs) And sometimes it was me that was, I don't want, no, we're going and you're going to have fun. And it, but you get out there and you start doing it and you end up having a, a great time. And then through that, through the years, now our family has close relationships. But you have to sometimes be disciplined to do those things even if it would be easier not to do it. It would be easier to stay home and sleep and not take the whole family for a hike in Guana. But we're gonna have more fun and make some memories and have some conversation if we do go for a hike in Guana or whatever it might be. And so my point is this, when it comes to prayer, Make prayer a priority, even if it is just a discipline at this moment. Leonard Ravenhill uh, was an English revivalist and um, lived his latter years in Texas. And you can go online and watch sermons of Leonard Ravenhill like in the 50s and 60s. This guy, I'm going to tell you, though, it's hard. Be ready. He just, he punch you right in the face. And uh, he's, he's just really good. He actually influenced Keith Green and, and a lot of the early YWAMers out there in uh, Texas. And, uh, but he wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. If we all want revival, if we all talk about it, sing about it, what's keeping it from happening? What's missing? 
Why does revival tarry? And he talks about prayer being one of those things. And he, and he says this, he says, the secret of prayer is praying in secret. And he goes on to say, Here, here's the secret of prayer. You have to actually do it. Like we could talk about it, we could, we could read books about it, we could do Bible studies about it, but at some point, we gotta get on our knees and actually do the thing. We actually need to pray. He goes on to say, what good is it to have library full of cookbooks and never cook food? It's not, you could study the recipes, you could do all, highlight them, you could have all the favorite things, you could watch cooking shows, you could pull up on YouTube and watch all the DIY cooking things, but at some point you gotta get in the kitchen and cook the food. And he says, this is what it's like for so many people in church when it comes to prayer. Here's when they pray, at church, when the pastor says, let's pray. Prayer needs to be a personal priority for all of us, and it might just need to be a discipline, but a discipline can become something you love. See, for me, my personality doesn't necessarily like that kind of structure. I don't like a plan. My plan is, let's see what happens. <laughs> I'm only kidding, I mean, I, I've learned the value of planning, okay, everybody just chill out, planning's important. <laughs> but I'm saying in my nature, by nature, my natural tendency is I want it to be more spontaneous. I want it to feel like authentic and real and not pre-programmed and, you know, but there does still need to be that discipline because sometimes that's what it takes to develop that in you. And here's, here's what I found though. When it is a discipline and you have that in there, now you can actually be free and spontaneous within it. Even like the liturgy we do each week in communion, we do a basic basically the same liturgy each week, which is right out of the Bible. But once we learn it, once it's in us, now we can actually be extemporaneous within it. Because understanding the format has actually liberated us to also be able to be led by the Spirit in the moment. And so that's what it's like when prayer is a discipline. Second thing is this, have a certain place to pray. So the first thing is make it a priority. The second thing is this, have a certain place to pray. It doesn't have to be the same place all the time, but you need to have some place where you pull away, unplug, disconnect. It says one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. In Matthew, he says, when you pray, go to your room. Go to a, um, unplug from everything, pull away from things. Other times it says he went to a desolate place or a solitary place. Most of his prayer was done in private, not just in a public meeting or in a forum where people get to see him pray, right? Pull away, unplug, go to a certain place. It might be in your car, it might be at your home, it might be on your back porch, it might be at your office when you can shut the blinds and turn everything off and pray, whatever it is, go to a certain place and pray. A lot of you have heard stories through the years of John Wesley uh, the Anglican priest who really founded the Methodist movement in the United States. And John Wesley was one of 14 kids. And a lot of the books written about him and things that he actually said in his sermons, it's well known that his mother, Susanna, was a woman of prayer. She was a praying woman. She had 14 kids. Where does a person with 14 kids get away to pray? When can you get away from 14 kids? If you have two kids, you can't get away. We've had, we've had our, our grandkids staying with us for a few days, and they're small, and we got two and one on the way. And uh, I, I went, can I just be this real? I went to a private room. You guys with me? And, and I just went to the private room for a moment. I shut the door. And as soon as I get in there, I hear, pops, pops. I'm like, I'm thinking of Susanna Wesley with 14 kids. So here's what she did. Her private place was, she usually had on an apron, she was always cooking something, right, with that many people. Her private place was, pull the apron over her head. She might be in the kitchen, she might be in the family room, she may be on the front porch, but if she needed to go to her solitary place to pray, it was apron over the head. And everybody knew if her apron's over the head, she's in her prayer closet, leave her alone. The point is, you need to pull away, you need to unplug, go to a private place where you can pray. It might literally be a closet, or it might be your office or your car or something, but pull away, unplug, so that you can pray, that you can actually communicate with God. The third thing is this, have a plan for prayer. A plan for prayer? Yes, have a plan for prayer. Um, 
even in this passage we'll look at in just, in just a moment when he says, pray then like this. Jesus says, pray like this. And he gives them what we have as the Lord's Prayer. We say it every Sunday, but that is also a structure for prayer. It's some guidelines to walk you through how to pray. When you pray, pray like this. Here's your plan. It's important to have a plan. You plan things that are important. And maybe you don't know how to do it. See, a lot of times people don't know how to pray, and so they get in there and they don't know what to say, and they're like, God, it's me, you know, we don't talk that often, but, you know, maybe you could, you know, hook me up or something. You know, we don't know what to pray. And so it's good to have a plan. Sometimes you need prayers, like a prayer book to give you a boost, to give you, you know, it's not wrong to pray prayers other people have written. People think this in the evangelical world. I'm not gonna pray a prayer somebody else wrote. That's not real, that's not. We sing songs other people wrote. And we're okay with that, right? We sing it as if it's ours. So you take these prayers other people wrote that put theology and thought into it, and then you can use that as a springboard to, give you go to get you going in the direction you need to go. You can still be spontaneous, but that helps. I love, personally, the prayer of examine. This was created by Ignatius of Loyola. He is the founder of the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. And after he had this amazing moment of conversion where God really enlightened him and he devoted himself to ministry, he realized there was so much about prayer and so much about ministry that the regular people couldn't really be a part of, that they didn't understand it. And so he wanted to come up with something that anybody as busy as they were could do. And it takes anywhere from five to 15 minutes to do the prayer of examine. And it's usually intended to be done at the end of a day. But you can do it midday or whenever, but that's typically when it is done. And the prayer of examine goes through five things. Relish the good. Just giving God praise for anything good that you can think of in your life. And it might be my sins are forgiven. It might be life itself. It might be that I had an unexpected friend stop by and brought me a really good cup of coffee. It might be whatever it is. Whatever good happened, relish the good. Request the Spirit. You ask the Holy Spirit, God, search my heart. I ask that your Holy Spirit would search my heart right now and show me anything in me that's not of you. Lead me in understanding what you're doing in my life. You ask the guidance, request the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Third thing is review the day. Through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, going back through the day. Show me any conversation, anything that I had this day that I need to, that maybe wasn't right, any wrong attitude, any wrong, any, anything wrong that was spoken. And the fourth thing is to repent from that wrongdoing. God, forgive me for doing that, for thinking that, for having that attitude. And then finally is to resolve to live well tomorrow. It takes five to 15 minutes to do that. It's a discipline, it's a structure, it's a plan, but you can still be free within it. That's just one example. Other examples are from uh, the Book of Common Prayer. They have morning prayer, midday prayer, and evening prayer that you can just pull out and do. I love the midday prayer, that's my favorite, where I can just pull away for a little bit of time in the office, open it up, read through it, go through it, and allow it to lead me where I reset my, to reset me, reorient me that day. Pray the Psalms, uh, whatever, have some sort of structure. And here, he gives them the Lord's Prayer as a structure. I wanna suggest that you need both. You need structure, and you need to be spontaneous. Just like in a relationship, right? You need to talk about things, you need to talk about what's on your heart, but you also plan times to talk about things that are important. If you have to go through something or confront something or you're working through some you know, future plans or financial things or if something's important to you, make an appointment to talk about it. And that's the same, is to spend some time both with a plan but also being spontaneous. This week uh, in the blog, if you follow, follow the blog, it picks up a little bit on this idea of the Lord's Prayer. I encourage you to check that out. But let's just go through this real quick. For the next, well, let's go through this for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll wrap up. So Jesus says, so when you pray, pray then like this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Connect with God relationally. It's not just some distant deity. I'm connecting with God relationally, and that is important. In Romans, it says, you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children, and now we call him Abba, Father. It speaks of this intimacy. Our Father, who art in heaven, God, I thank you that you're not a distant God far away, but you are near even now. Even when I'm unaware, I know that you're near. I know that you love me. I know that you care for me. I know that you are a good Father. Hallowed be your name. Worship his name. 
then you just begin to give God praise for who he is. God, I thank you that you alone are God. You alone are the most high. You alone are worthy of all things. God, I thank you that your name is a refuge. In fact, Psalm says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs to it and is safe. Then you pray his agenda. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, so many times I come in with my agenda, and it's okay to bring my request. It's okay to bring the things that are on my heart to the Lord, but then at the end of the day, Lord, help me get in line with your will. I want what's on your heart to be what's on my heart. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I bring you all these things, but I yield and surrender and submit them to you. Give us this day our daily bread. Depend on him for everything. I recognize that everything that I have comes from you. I give you praise and thanks for it. And God, you know the needs that I still have. You know the things that are going on in my life right now. And I pray, God, that, that you move in our lives and my life to meet those needs. Give us this day our daily bread. David said, I look to the mountains. Does not my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I depend on him for everything. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a time for me to get my heart right with God and with other people. God, forgive me my debts. I've sinned against you. I know the things that have been in my mind and my heart. I know the things that I've done and I've done done. Be specific. I'm being general now, but in your private time, be specific. And help me, God, to forgive others who have done wrong to me that, I'm, that I have hurt feelings about or unforgiveness towards. Help me to release that and forgive, forgive them. It's a time to get my heart right with God and other people. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is such good news for us. It's good news for me, because none of us can be good all the time. None of us can do the right thing all the time. None of us can earn it. Our best efforts, our, all of our good works, no matter how much money we could give, how many people we could serve, how many times we could pray, how many times I could make sure I have all the right thoughts, if I could do all that, it would still, my righteousness would only, would not even reach one step on the stairway to heaven, right? We can't get there that way. We don't deserve it. Engage in spiritual warfare and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is how Jesus says, this then is how you should pray, like this. And here we do the spiritual warfare. We recognize our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. This is where the battle is. This is where the struggle is. This is where I need to spend some time in prayer where I really need to fight. Uh, I, I may have mentioned this before, but when I was a teenager, one of the Christian bands I was really into, they're actually coming in concert, and I will not be here to see it, unfortunately, Petra. You guys ever heard of Petra? Any, any old school people ever heard of Petra? Uh, man, Petra, the rock cries out, right? Because Petra means rock, and they were a rock band. Anyway, um, they, they had a song They had a song that I loved, and it used to really move me, and it was, it was, it was get on your knees and fight like a man. You want to fight like a man? Get on your knees and fight like a man. That's where we do battle. That's where we engage in spiritual warfare because that's where the struggle is. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. As fully devoted followers of Jesus, this is how he instructs us. Let's not just talk about it. Let's not just say that's a moving thought. Let's actually be people to respond and pray even if in the beginning it is only a discipline, and watch it grow and develop and become a love. Would you stand with me as we prepare for communion? Following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, following God, is not a religion. It is a relationship. We do religious things. We have religious activity that we do that helps inform that. But in, it, in and of itself, Christianity is not, it's not about a religion. It is about a relationship. 
That's why prayer is so important. It's communication with God. Our very relationship with God begins with a prayer. That's how we come into relationship with God. It's to acknowledge I've sinned. It's to confess him as Lord. He says, if you believe in your heart and confess that he is Lord, you'll be saved. And Jesus said, you need to. He said, you need to be born again. You need this. And it begins with a prayer like that. We begin with a prayer. Our relationship continues with prayer. Let's be people as followers of Jesus who are fully devoted to prayer. I don't want anybody feeling any kind of condemnation or guilt that you're not doing something enough. Uh, It's okay to feel convicted, that moves us, but not condemned, not judged, not criticized. And I don't want you to feel the pressure that you have to pray a certain way. It's just communication with God. Find the things that can help inform you and help cultivate it. In fact, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster says, this is something you can learn. That's why the disciple said, teach us how to pray. You can learn this. It's something that can be cultivated and developed. And that's, that's really my hope for us because prayer matters. Amen. Would you bow your hearts with me as we prepare for communion? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I just want to encourage you to, you, you pray it, you make it your own, pray it by faith. I'll give you the words, but you make it your prayer. And we're going to pray a prayer of confession that we all sin, we all fall short, we've all turned to our own ways. Everybody in here is just gonna admit it together. Nobody's better than anybody else. We're all equal in this and we're gonna admit it. God, we've sinned. But be specific about it when, I, when you get to that point of the prayer. And then we're gonna confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior and then come to communion. Would you pray with me? Let's repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I confess you as my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God is good, isn't he? You guys can be seated.